this webinar video on summer annual forages by Mr. Jeremy Kickler at University of Georgia is supported in part by SAIR and is part of a collaborative effort that includes Fort Valley State University and AgriUnity LLC Cattle Division. Let's go ahead and get started, I guess. Jeremy, did you want to introduce yourself briefly before you start? Sure, I'd be, be glad to. I'm Jeremy Kickler. I'm the County Extension Agent down in Moultrie, Georgia, Colquitt County. Uh, I've been a county agent for 23 years with row crop and forage and commercial livestock responsibilities. I've been in Moultrie going on nine years. Previously, you know, that I was in Macon County for 10, working with dairies and, and cattle producers up in that part of the world. And um, hey, I'm glad to be here and um, thank you for the invite. All right, so Jeremy's going to talk to us about spring or warm season forages yeah so we're going to talk about summer annuals you know your your pearl millets stuff like that as a county agent i get a lot of questions all the time about forages summer annual forages it was interesting talking about you know bermuda grass varieties a little while ago here and here in the, the conversation there you know bermuda grass is just getting more and more challenging to produce you know we're dealing with stem mag bermuda grass stem maggots price of fertilizer, price of potassium. We had the army worm outbreak a, a couple of years ago where, you know, the pythroids didn't really work anymore. And it's getting really, really challenging to, you know, produce. Sometimes you can't get spriggers to come when you want them to. And, and sometimes spriggers, you know, don't have the varieties that you really want. So folks down here are looking at Bahia grass again. I got a couple of growers, um, you know, looking at UF Riata and also TIFF Quick. So those are some of the some of the you know seeing how some of these forage systems are are moving, or are, are are changing you know over the last few years. But in Georgia, you know we're we're a diver very diverse state when it comes to forages. Up in North Georgia, you know you got some tall fescue up there. Um, Bermuda grass is is on on the higher end of the of the spectrum there. Winter and summer annuals, and then also some legumes. You know down here in South Georgia. Bermuda grass is king. Like I was saying before, you know, it's getting more challenging to produce. You know, down in this area, we grow a lot of Alicia. Alicia, Bermuda grass gets, you know, leaf rust. It gets a couple other diseases. Stem maggots prefer it. Um, stem maggots prefer, you know, finer stem Bermudas and stuff like that. So that's why people are looking at Bahia grass again, especially in grazing situations. You know, it's it from a fertility standpoint, it's a lower lower fertility requiring perennial forage or base forage. It does get some dollar spot here and there, but you know, we're looking at UF Riata and also um, TIFF Quick. We also put um, a lot of emphasis on annuals in this part of the world. A lot of beef cattle producers, at least in Cockwood County, we do a lot of oat baleage. Um, starting to see a little bit of triticale grown. You know, there's a couple of dairies in the area that actually contract triticale for, 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 for silage. And then we also do quite a bit of pearl millet, you know, from a grazing and also silage standpoint. And then, you know, mainly charisma clover as, as legumes here. So how is, how are our forage production programs? You know, what, what do they look like in the Southeast? Um, so in October, November, we're planting our, our winter annuals and, you know, oats, rye. I like rye and rye grass, you know, as forage, as winter annual forages, because that rye comes on earlier. And then, you know, right now, um, this rye grass is starting to really kick in. That's that's probably the base. That That's what we really need in these forage production programs right now. Bermuda grass is, is starting to green up. Um, we're starting to fertilize Bermuda grass. Rule of thumb on Bermuda grass fertilization is, you know, once we get up in this 65 degree soil temps um, and really start going into that green up, it's time to pop it with Bermuda, I mean, nitrogen. So, you know, Alicia, you know, this tipped 85 starting to green up really well. Coastal, we're starting to sprig some jigs down here too. So, you know, that's, that's Bermuda grass is probably going to be our base forage there. Crabgrass is another summer annual that, that I get questions about. And tonight we're going to concentrate on some of these summer annual forages, such as your pearl millet and sorghum sudam. But this is this is how a lot of the forages are distri distributed, you know, across the calendar here in the southeast. The warm season annual grasses, 
Um, on the left hand side, we have sorghum Sudan. Notice that the that it's more of a upright type growth pattern. Um, pearl millet, on the other hand, it's it's on the right hand side. I like pearl millet. I would recommend more pearl millet for grazing. And it's more of a tillering or bait, you know, it grows from basil tillers. And that's going to impact, you know, the way we graze it, how we manage it, how we cut hay. So, you know, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So these summer annuals, they're useful for finishing cattle. Um, a lot of producers kind of fill in this gap. You know, we plant it. The, the big question this year was was planting date. You know, we were very warm first of March. And usually with, with, with pearl millet, you know, it's got a little photo period sensitive trait in it. So you kind of want to do it after March 25th, but pearl millet is a little bit more sensitive compared to corn when it comes to cold, cold temperatures. So, you know, probably tax day on is probably my rule of thumb on, on planting dates for, for pearl millet, but these summer annuals are so good for finishing, you know, cattle. Also too, um, if you remember back in when we had droughts and everything, like I know 2011 was bad. We had periods of drought back, you know, mid 2000s, but we filled in, you know, during those droughty summers, we did fill in those forage gaps with, with summer annuals, you know, everything from brown top millet to pearl millet. to So that really gives it a unique fit for, for that too. Also see a lot of pearl millet being wrapped up for baleage. You know, these summer annuals can be a challenge to, to dry down. And I think it's a really good fit you know, if you're capable of, you know, baleage production, um, you know, we could probably get some of these moistures down to 50, 60 percent, you know, if we got mower conditioners. But, you know, I think as emergency um, feeding or, or, you know, if baleage is, is available on your farm, I think that fits a very unique, unique niche right there. So, you know, water use is, is a big thing now um, in agronomics, but this is water use in forage crops. You know, this table shows us basically um, five different forage crops, alfalfa being, being a C3 crop. And then we have Sudan grass and corn, and then we also have sorghum and, and Bermuda grass. But what I like about this shows you the efficiency of how these forage crops use water. Um, for example, alfalfa, it takes about seven and a half acre inches to produce a ton of dry matter. Sudan grass and corn, on the other hand, um, takes about 45% of that. So so three and a half or three and a third acre inches produce a ton of dry matter. And then sorghum and Bermuda grass are more efficient, even more efficient than that, taking a little over two acre inches, you know, to produce a ton of dry matter, which, you know, in the summertime, you know, sometimes water supplies can be limited. So we kind of got to strategically plan how we allocate that water and, you know, uh, species selection can help us with that. Some typical yields of forage crops, um, you know, corn silage, you know, you could produce, you know, and this, this is reported in pounds of dry matter per acre. So, you know, now I hear 20 tons, 22 tons of corn silage if, if you're planted late. Tropical corn, if you plant later on, would be less than that. But if you look at you know, our annual ryegrass, oats and trit, triticale, or our winter annual forages, you know, we can produce quite a bit of dry matter, uh, especially with oats and, and ryegrass, you know, anywhere from six to 14,000 pounds, three, three to seven dry matter tons per acre. Your Bermudas, your coastal and tip 85, you know, if, if you, if you add in three or four cuttings per year, you know, you're in that seven to you know, 14, 15,000 pound dry matter. And, and this is in pounds of dry matter per acre. And then on the bottom, forward sorghum, Sudan grass, and then a pearl millet, um, anywhere from, you know, realistically 10, 12, 14,000 pounds of dry matter, depending on how you cut it and, and graze it. Here's some more data from, from OVT, you know, from 15 and 16 at the, at the Griffin and in, in Tifton locations, you know, showing, when it was dry and and I think 16 was a drier year, but you know, we can we can make some pretty decent dry matter yields off these summer forages. So pearl millet, I like pearl millet. It's very pretty, it's really drought tolerant, it, but it has its fit. Um, it's it's not as high yielding as as our sorghum Sudan or forage sorghum, slightly slower growing compared to the sorghums. And I know, and we talked about planting dates earlier, but 
you know, it's a little bit more sensitive to cold weather compared to corn. That's why we can plant corn, you know, first of March. Um, pearl millet, we need to, you know, this is about time that that's, if we can get past this cold snap, I think it's the time to start putting in pearl millet. You don't want to bury it three quarter to an inch deep, 12 to 15 pounds of, of, of seed per acre. If you're going to drill it in, basically double it, you know, if you're going to broadcast it and hair it in. But when you hair it in, please don't bury it. Um, you want about an inch or a joint deep on your planting depth. And some of the varieties that we recommend, um, I recommend a lot of Tiffley 3 for grazing. Um, that's a good, that's a UGA release. And it's, it's, it's a good variety for both baleage and also grazing. Planting dates, Dennis Hancock did this work back in 2000 to 2009, three years of work. And this is the effective planting date on rain fed pearl millet yields. This was actually done in Watkinsville. And he had five different planting dates, late April, May, late June, July, and August. And late April gave us, you know, every year, late April gave us the, the highest yields that we can get. Um, and there were significant differences um, in yield all three years when, when we shifted that planting date to May and then had another reduction in June. So you know, planting this stuff early, that's how we can achieve, you know, the highest yields with this summer annual. So to sum that up, late, late plantings of pearl millet, um, total dry, dry matter yield can be reduced by as much as 80 pounds per acre for each day planting is delayed past late April. Um, if we get into mid-June, we could take a third um, of a yield reduction um, and go all the way to half half a yield if we can go into mid-July. Sometimes we got to go into June and July because of rain or equipment or, or what have you, but you know, those are more realistic expectations of yield potential with this, with this pearl millet. So according to this, you know, staggering pearl millet plantings beyond late April may not improve how it's distributed over the year, but you know, it may, it may give us that little extra bump to get us over a hump if we have to plant late. So those are some expectations of pearl millet planted late. All right, how does it does on steer production? Um, this was actually some of Carl Hovland's work years and years ago. Carl's been gone a long time. Um, this is steer performance on pearl millet on tiff leaf one over two years. So basically he put five weight steers, 550 pound steers on pearl millet, grazed them, had, had a had a um, average stocking rate of three steers per acre and did it for about 68 days. And that resulted in an average daily gain of about a pound and a half a day, which is not bad, you know, when you have to deal with heat and, you know, extreme summer temperatures and stuff like that. So from a, from an acre gain standpoint, it was about 400 pounds of gain. So that's not bad, especially in the summertime, um, you know, when we're trying to put meat on the bone, especially with cow prices being the way they are, we're trying to put on gains as, as cheap as we can. So when we talk about these summer annuals, we we have to think about, you know, how to manage them from a hay and also grazing standpoint. So we're going to talk about basal versus auxiliary bud growth. Um, pearl millet is going to be more, you know, it's going to re regrow from tillers or basal buds. Your sorghum sudans, uh, forward sorghums are going to have auxiliary buds or suckers. So that's going to impact the way that we manage these forages so we can get excellent regrowth and, and we can utilize this, this, this crop more efficiently. This is a good illustration here, pearl millet. See how it's kind of tillered, kind of ha has a tiller regrowth. Um, it produces new shoots from the base of the plant. And I actually had a grower make this comment the other day where he basically, he let the cows in and didn't really manage the, the grazing of these steers and stuff on pearl millet and grazed it down to the ground. And with pearl millet, you want to graze it to, to have a stubble height of four to six inches and then take them off. That way, the, these tillers can rebound and then we can refertilize and get, get some more grazing, you know, a couple of weeks after we take them off. So it's all about utilization because these summer annuals can be very expensive, you know, with the price of fertilizer, we have to manage them so we can get the most gain, you know, per pound, you know, at the cheapest price we can get. So long story short, basal height, four to six inches, take them off, 
that way that pearl millet will, will bounce back you know let it rest in between grazing from taking them off to grazing in about two weeks or you know if you're going to do for hay or baleage you know about 28 or 30 days you know later you can you can get another cutting of pearl millet forage sorghum is again a drought tolerant you know plant it, it's it's higher yielding compared to pearl millet faster growing but one of the one of the challenges that we have with forage sorghum is you know it has very thick stems and I think this is a better better fit for for silage production. I know dairies they used to up around Macon County. We were doing corn silage in the spring, forage sorghum in the fall, and oftentimes you know moisture management with the forage sorghum was 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 a challenge. And just some thicker stems. If you plant forage you know forage sorghum, um, inch inch and a half deep, six to eight you know pounds per acre. If you're going to drill it, um, again you know sorghum's not as you know, we need to plant in April, you know, when them soil, two inch soil temperatures get about 65 degrees. And we got some pretty decent varieties too. There's a Forever Green, Raybo 86S, which is probably in the Agritech bag now. And then we got a 7401, which is an Alta variety. I think that's a Veretic Dwarf. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those type of varieties here in a minute. Basically, you know, they have shorter internodes to make it you know, shorter stock, so you wouldn't have so many lodging problems. I see a little bit of sedan grass, not much, a little bit thinner stems, but still, you know, it's it's still pretty difficult to dry down without a mower conditioner. A lot of these summer annuals, you know, they just either for silage or for baleage, or I think it's a good fit for them. Again, plant it similar to the sorghum forage sorghum, an inch, inch and a half deep, 10 to 15 pounds per acre is your seeding rate, and some of the varieties are listed below. Um, Sudan headless and then Trudan headless, those are some old varieties, but, you know, still good varieties. Sorghum Sudan, um, I see a little bit of this, you know, same characteristics as the other two. Seeding rate, if, if you decide to drill it in rows, 15 to 20 pounds per acre. And then with Sorghum Sudan grasses, too, you, you have some BMR, brown midrib, um, varieties. BMR, you know, have less lignin in them, so the digestibility is probably going to be a little bit better. Um, we got some data here at the end of this presentation talking about that, but, you know, when you have less lignin, you know, your your lodging potential goes up just a little bit too. So here's an illustration showing the three different, the, the forages here with sorghum backgrounds. Uh, the forage sorghum is on the left. Sudan grass is is thinner. It's in the middle, and then your sorghum Sudan hybrids on the right hand side. And that kind of shows you the differences, you know, in the head, you know, at maturity. But this is a good illustration here where we have forage sorghum on the left, um, real thick stems. In the middle, uh, we had Sudan grass. And notice that the, you know, th there are thinner tillers there compared to the forage sorghum. And then there on the right hand side, your sorghum Sudan grass, which has the intermediate, you know, diameter tillers there. Um, but, you know, with, with these with these type of forages here, you know, drying it down for hay is going to be your challenge here because of the because of stem diameter and, and trying to get that moisture down to 15 percent. Again, we're going to talk about bud growth there, you know, with these sorghum, anything with a sorghum background. Um, your forward sorghums, sorghum Sudan, you know, you're going to, they're going to come back from suckers. So with sorghum Sudan grass, if you're going to manage, if you're going to graze that, we need to graze it down to maybe, you know, a foot tall. And that will optimize regrowth. And, you know, so grazing, it's going to take a little bit of more management with your grazing, um, maybe a frontal grazing or rotational grazing to make these summer annuals work so they can, you know, bounce back you know, when we take those cows off. Crabgrass is interesting. Usually in B Bermuda grass, we're trying to get rid of crabgrass. Um, but, you know, if you're in the dairy business or, you know, grazing beef cows, crabgrass comes up quite regularly. It's not as drought tolerant. Um, it's pretty easy to grow, but I've had people interseeded in Bermuda grass and, and, I don't know. We just we got to figure this out. I know um, 
Lisa and Jennifer Tucker are playing with with crabgrass. I know Dennis was playing with crabgrass um, with Pearl Millet a few years ago. So I think there's some, some potential there. You know, it can fill in gaps and mixtures. So I've, I've seen people use crabgrass or Pearl Millet, maybe, you know, four ounces of crab in with 12 to 15 pounds of Pearl Millet. Um, and the reasoning behind that would be you can get the Pearl Millet you know, you'll get some earlier grazing with the pearl millet and maybe, you know, when that crabgrass comes on, that fits in a little bit of that forage gap um, where we can keep on grazing. But, you know, we have um, four to six pounds per acre if you drill it or broadcast it, very small seed. But, you know, I think what we're doing with these other production systems is burying the seed. You, you barely need to cover it up, you know, quarter inch deep. Um, Oftentimes we can start planting crab, crabgrass by the time, you know, volunteer crabgrass comes up about the time that we start planting corn, which would be 60 degrees soil temperature. We probably need to be closer to 65, you know, for crabgrass. But some of the varieties you see is Red River. Um, that's out of Arkansas, I think. Mojo, not Mogo. I think that's a typo on the slide here, but Mojo is another one. I think that's from Southeast Agri-Seeds. And then quick and big, I've seen some quick and big out, you know, on, on a farm or two. Usually that's a quicker, earlier maturing variety. So, you know, Dr. Hancock used to say quick and done, but, you know, that would be another variety that you can try. So the dairymen, they like crabgrass. When I was working with dairies, usually with herbicide selection on perennial pastures, the, the biggest question was, will it kill crabgrass? So it kind of fits in a niche. Um, you know, kind kind of fit in, you know, short short term, you know, forage gaps. So I thought this was interesting. This is Dr. Beck at um, back in 07. This is where he he looked at common crabgrass and he took, you know, he cut hay down to a stubble height of two inches tall. And this was after this is basically regrowth after a July cutting of of of, of hay. He let the crabgrass regrow for 21 days. Um, we had about a ton of dry matter, you know, in, in that first cutting. But look at the crude protein of 15% and also TDN of, of energy at 62%. If he if he let that crabgrass grow for 35 days after that initial cutting, we did, you know, we basically tripled our our yield in the dry matter basis. But, you know, crude protein and TDN basically came down a little bit. Um, so the quality does come down, but, you know, for short term forage gaps, I think this is a good option here if you can get it to come up. Speaking of quality, quality differences in, in forage, you know, species here, you know, the, these tropical annual grasses like, you know, your sorghum sudans, they can range in digestibility from, from upper 40s to about 70, depending on maturity at harvest, and also the cool season annual grasses. Um, are right there too, ranging from upper 40s all the way up to above 80 degree digestibility. You got to think about, you know, if you have a, a class of livestock that's just in, in the maintenance, such as dry cows, a lot of these forages can, can be utilized to satisfy those needs. But, you know, it's all about hay testing, trying to figure out what those forages are. So if you have high class of livestock that need high, high levels of digestibility, you know, your cool season annuals are, are probably going to meet those needs there. So hay testing, you know, I can't, that, that's a tool that that's really underutilized. Um, you know, it just takes a little bit of time. And for $20, you know, we can do it at UGA. Um, we have that NIR type of way of doing forage samples now. Gives it quick and it gives you TDN, RFQ, and also crude protein to formulate, you know, supplementation if we need to do that. All right, so this is, I, I like baleage. Baleage is interesting. So we have a TDN. Um, I think Dr. Hancock did this back in 2015. It showed a BMR, baleage, sorghum sudan, pearl millet, and then also pearl millet with crabgrass in it. So from an energy standpoint, it was good enough to, you know, satisfy a five weight steer, you know, for an average daily gain of, of a pound and a half a day. So forward sampling, knowing what that quality knowing what that what that forage is um can mean can mean a lot 
Um, but oftentimes, you know, for a nine weight steer, you know, we'll just have to supplement a little bit on that. What about protein? You know, so a lot of these forages are running, you know, 10 to 11 percent protein. So we got we got some potential here to to get a high quality forage if you can get the, the moisture to 50, 60 percent. 50 to 60 percent to make sure it ensiles. All right, one thing about seed and summer annual forages, oftentimes we talk about summer annuals actually in January and February, we need to book the seed early. So we, we will be ready to get it in, um, be ready to, you know, get that forage crop growing. You know, summer annual forage pest, if you have a, something with a sorghum background, sugarcane aphid, as has given us fits. Um, you see dairymen now looking at, you know, back to back, you know, silage, corn silage. So they'll grow, some folks are growing, you know, spring corn silage and fall corn silage because of cane aphid. They can't grow, you know, forward sorghum anymore because of cane aphid. But, you know, there are varieties now that have some level of tolerance to, to sugar cane aphid. We do have Savanto. Um, but usually, you know, the, these these cane aphids will flare up pretty pretty quick. So being out in the field, scouting it, pearl millet is more tolerant to sugar cane aphid. It's more of these it's more of these species that have a have sorghum in the background. Chinch bugs, um, when it gets hot, chinch bugs come out. Um, you can use you know pythroid, baythroid, Mustang Max. Um, you know, if you had a history of chinch bugs, you know, two to three weeks after emergence, the time to time to put out the, the bug killer. That would be something to consider there. Also, we can use uh, seed treatments. Uh, there's a metacloprid or something like that. And that will help you also somewhat help you with, with sugarcane aphid. I think Transform is labeled on forage sorghum um, for sugarcane aphid control, but talk to your seed dealers um, about seed treatments um, because you, know, you can put insecticide on it. And also if you have a forage sorghum, you know, I would probably recommend getting concept treated. People talk about weed control, got to control the weeds. So with millets, you can use 2,4-D, a pint of 2,4-D um, on it. The thing challenging about 2,4-D products is there's a lot of variability in grazing restrictions. So refer to that label, but, but most of them have a withdrawal before slaughter restriction. So you take them off so many days before slaughter, but please look at the label there. There's a lot of variability with that. Um, you can use Weed Master, Weed Master, and Outlaw. Uh, those are two uh, tank mix products. They have their, their tank mix of 2,4-D and dicamba. But with these with these oxen type herbicides, we need to wait to these these summer annuals get you know eight, 10, 12 inches tall before we you know pull the trigger on that. Um, but with Weed Master, there's no grazing restriction between application and grazing of non-lactating lactating dairy animals. So so it, it's got a pretty it's got a pretty you know soft um, grazing restriction with that. Now with forage sorghum, if you're going to grow a forage sorghum, please get concept treated. You know, sorghum, if you, if you have concept treated seed, that means you can put a product called dual out or metolachlor. Metolachlor is a group 15 herbicide. Um, and if you if you have sorghum with concept treated, that gives you tolerance to that herbicide there. So dual has activity on pigweed, which we have a lot of here in Georgia. It's got okay control of grass, but you can do that pre-emerge. You plant it, put it out pre, um, and you know it, it's a good product. You can use atrazine on forward sorghum, sorghum Sudan. You can use a pound, you know, a little over a pound of active ingredient per acre. So if you're using a 4L product, you know, that, that's like 1.2 quarts of atrazine. Um, I know corn's more tolerant to it. You know, your forward sorghum products, um, you need to wait until, you know, we're three leaf stage, a few inches tall. Um, but that would be, I would just do it with some crop oil. I wouldn't put it in with, you know, liquid fertilizer or anything like that because you'll burn, you know, the forward sorghum with it. Nitrates, they can, they, you know, you can get it in, in both sorghum background forages and also pearl millet. Obviously, it, it occurs, you know, in drought stress situations. 
but oftentimes nitrates, they concentrate in the lower part of the canopy um, or in the lower part of the stem. So if, if you raise up that cutter bar, um, you, can, you can dilute some of these nitrates down. Um, prussic acid, I had more prussic acid calls last October um, when we had that cold weather come through. This is why I like pearl millet because pearl millet does not really accumulate prussic acid. Usually if we wait to, to graze these forage sorghums or sorghum sudans, you know, once they get about two foot tall, that means there's more, you know, plant matter there to dilute that prussic acid. And usually we get these concerns after a frost event like we had in October. But every time you chop, you know, so so to really deal with prussic acid, um, anytime you chop it, um, you do hay, anytime you, you handle that forage, you know, it, it kind of lets out the prussic acid out of that forage. It, it kind of dissipates a little bit. So genetic traits, uh, BMRs, I'm kind of fascinated with the BMR trait that that has a, you know, that's a trait in some of these forage sorghums and stuff. Um, basically reduced lignin content. Some some of these forage background forages, um, you know, they could be photo period sensitive, which means that, you know, you can plant them later in the year. That alta variety is a paretic dwarf variety, which means it has shortened internode distance. So it's shorter plant, less um, likely to lodge over. Um, so those are some of the genetics that we have in these summer annuals here. Brown midrib, the way that you can look for brown rib, midrib is, I wish I had a picture of the leaf, but usually, you know, the leaf vein would be, you know, darker or, or brown. If you cut around the root there, um, you'll see, you'll see the browning around this area here. Less lignin means more, you know, more digestibility. So I thought this was really interesting. Um, Beck, back in 07, looked at the digestibility of non-BMR and BMR sorghum sudan at three different stages of development. So basically, <clears throat> the more mature that forage got, um, the less decrease in digestibility the BMR had compared to the non-BMR. So it holds digestibility it's a little bit higher digestibility um, compared to the non-BMR, the later or the more or mature, more mature that forage got. Also too, um, Dr. Tesh, he was up at Virginia Tech for a while in the mid, mid 2000s, 2014 actually, now he's at Kentucky. But he also looked at, um, you know, there's different BMR traits. Um, if we look at BMR traits, you know, you probably want to look at a BMR6 trait. Um, and this is digestibility among Virginia Tech variety trials. And as a whole, you know, the BMR6 traits seem to do better compared to the 12s and 18s. So, you know, that, that's what the interest is going to go to is the more of the BMR6. This is some of the, you know, the Georgia OVTs. They do uh, some evaluation of varieties. Um, this is an example of that back in 2022, last year on dry land. Um, oftentimes I get questions about how you read these things. So you have the varieties on the left, you got the harvest dates. Usually if it's if the yields are in bold, that means there's no significant differences among those varieties. But one thing to look at, for example, with the sorghum, sorghum Sudan grasses, um, there were some BMRs that were actually in the upper part of the yield variety trials, which is kind of interesting. Usually years ago, more of the BMRs were a little bit lower, you know, in the yield responses. So we're starting to see some BMRs in the upper part. Um, and then also we have narrow stem or pearl millet. Um, sorghum partners at Millex 32, that, that's a pearl millet there. Um, but I think, you know, so those are some of the some of the grazing type of millets that we have here that were that that have been evaluated at Georgia OVT in Tifton. Nitrogen, how much nitrogen for pearl millet and stuff um, when grazing? Apply forty to sixty pounds for establishment, and then probably I, I often say fifty to sixty pounds each month during the grazing system. You know, if you're doing silage or sorghum silage, you need to bump it up. 
but the same, you know, basically you need to split up your nitrogen applications just from, you know, a nitrate standpoint. You know, if you're if you're growing underneath irrigation, you can probably bump up those, you know, in rates a little bit. But it's all about, you know, allocating that nitrogen at the right time, splitting it up because, you know, nitrate poisoning is something that we really don't want to deal with. I hope you don't have to deal with it. I'm an ag economist by trade. This is some, so I took UGA recommendations and this is summer grazing pearl millet. This is just cost of production, you know, so it does cost a lot of money to produce these forages. So to total variable cost is about $400 an acre and every farm is different. So you have different costs, you have different, you know, you, you go to different retailers, you know, to get fertilizers. But, you know, these are some prices from retailers in Moultrie. Um, you know, nitrogen is, is about a dollar ten a unit, 75 cents for P and K. But those, those nitrogen, you know, so this is grazing millet. And then the P and K levels is basically, you know, medium soil test level according to UGA. But, you know, if, if you want some of these spreadsheets, I'll be happy to share them with you. But the most important column is the one that says your farm because your fixed costs are going to be different but this just gives you an idea about all right percentage of cost for example fertilizer is going to be probably the most of our our cost you know our variable cost with these with these annuals i don't know if anybody does i had to do a budget for somebody the other day for for forage sorghum but it cost you know 17 tons most of it's fertilizer but you know you're looking at about 40 dollars a ton um you know, just a, just a quick tailgate math type of scenario. But, you know, if, if you want a copy of this budget, I'll be happy to give it to you. But, you know, trying to figure out what is the most economical way of doing it is, is key. And again, you know, your farm is the most important column on these budgets. All right, so that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? This is this is James Ford. A few years ago, uh, in Amer at America's Plant Material Center, they had some research on eastern gamma grass and Alamo switchgrass. Is that something that you recognize that would be pretty good for uh, raising? Um, most of grazing here is going to be most of our forage production systems is going to be, um, you know, your pearl millet. We're going to graze it, or for baleage. Um, and then in October, November, we're going to plant probably oat baleage or oats. Um, and then on the grazing <laughs> systems, we're going to do rye, rye grass, if we can oversee these, these Bahia or Bermuda grass pastures. I don't really have anybody doing those two particular species right there. Those yeah. are perennials, aren't they? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. are perennials. Right. I, I think, I think we have some in Fort Valley. I, I haven't been impressed i think we have i think we have the gamma grass and and it isn't it a bunch grass i, I, I haven't yeah i haven't been that impressed with it myself but but i think it's it requires a lot more management than than some of the others in, in my opinion excuse me this is omar mccants uh hello it sounds like sounds like you uh you feel pretty good about the pearl millet can you no-till drill it uh, must you harrow the land first? So a lot of these forages, a lot of these winter or annual forages respond to deep tillage. So one thing, you know, we, we have challenge with, challenges with is, you know, compaction. So you can no-till it, but I think the yields are going to be off, you know, especially in these sandier soils. Okay. Yeah, Alfred Greenley. My question, uh, do we have the same data on TIF 85 and the other Bermuda grasses? Yes, there's data out there, yes. Yes, compare it. Yes, there is. Um, so TIF 85 is, is a lot coarser compared to Alicia and JEGS. Um, it's somewhat harder to, you know, dry down. But, you know, from a digestibility standpoint, it's 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 more digestible compared to, you know, Alicia and some of these other ones and even coastal. And because it's coarser, is it more resistant to 
what were you saying stem maggot or yes. uh, some of the things that are that like the finer stem ones better yes so 85 you know if you're if you're grazing um and if you can get it you know 85 would be an excellent choice um, as your perennial base um it can be a little bit harder to get going from a sprigging standpoint but it seems like here lately you know getting a sprigger you know spriggers are backed up um so the availability of 85 and is going to be you know up to that particular company that's going to be sprigging that bermuda grass okay what about the um the tdn and the uh, crude protein for those stock grasses it's going to be a little bit higher it's probably going to be i can pull up that data i've seen the slide today but it, it's probably five maybe ten percent more digestible compared to coastal okay yes Yes. So when I first initially logged on um, earlier, you had mentioned tiff quick. So it's a Bahia grass. And my question for you, in my part of the country this year, uh, tiff quick is about $50 more than tiff not. Is, is it really that much of advanced grass than tiff not? All right, so this is an excellent question. Um, okay, so from a forage quality and yield standpoint, they're about the same. Now, there the big question about TIF quick is, is that it doesn't have as basically if you get a half inch of rain, all the seeds going to germinate all at the same time with the TIF quick. Now with the TIF nine, there's some seed germin seed dormancy um so it's gonna come up or emerge it's gonna come up you're gonna have about 50 percent or so you know when that rain and then the rest of it's gonna come up later so when we're trying to plant bermuda i mean bahia grass it turns off dry in april and may right so right. it's gonna be at a premium so that extra 50 dollars to get that seed emergence is probably gonna be well worth it you know because you know, it may turn off dry or whatever. So getting the stand is, is everything with the hay grass. So the second part of my question, um, with Bahia, in my part of the country, if you does nothing, you got this wild Bahia, it just grows. Um, and we know that Roundup has doubled and sometimes, in some cases, tripled. Right. Rather than to kill what's out there, how much damage would I be doing if I just drilled, uh, put some 2,4-D out there just to kill the weeds, to save the behavior that's out there, and drilled in some TIF-9 or TIF-Quick on top of what's already out there? Is, is that uh, advisable? I think you're going to run into competition issues with, with that TIF-9 or you know interceding you know the the, the bahia grass into an extending you know existing bahia grass stand so i think you're going to have there's going to be a lot of competition there so what i usually tell people in that scenario there is to kind of stagger the plantings so do a little bit at a time and that way you you you'll get a full stand now we're we are planting a lot of uf riata here um the last few years that seemed to be what people were growing um it's not as photo period sensitive compared to like tiff quick so it, it greens up a little bit earlier in the spring um and it goes into dormancy a little bit later in the fall but you know it, it's a lot of people are trying that and getting really good stands with it hey this is um lamar berry um yes, got a question in reference to uh, the sorghum uh, for baleage. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I know it's going to be a challenge uh, drying it, and I do not have a dryer, but if I'm dry, if I'm cutting it uh, in 90 plus degree temperature, and I know it's going to take, you know, take longer um, for that stem to dry, um, you know, uh, probably a week drying time. Uh, about what percentage of protein will I lose in that? 
Okay, so from a forge, all right, so with baleage, it's getting it down to 50, 60 percent moisture. That That's probably a good moisture to get it down to, to do this for it to, to, to install correctly. Um, and, and the thing with the forge sorghums is if we can get a mower conditioner, something to crimp that, that stem to, to lower that internal moisture. Um, you know, so from a forage quality standpoint, you know, stage of maturity at, at harvest is, is one of the most important things you can. But getting the baleage, you know, at that correct moisture, you know, that influences everything, how it ensiles, get that pH of that forage down. You know, you talk about all that acidic acid and in, 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 in just the ensiling process. Um, you know, that that's that's where that moisture comes into play. If that makes sense. So forage qualities is, is I think will be more influenced by stage of maturity at harvest. Okay, but if it if I'm taking if if I'm taking longer for especially with the uh, sorghum for it to dry out, will I lose that um in drying it? So no, no, oh. no. So so if you if you cut something, for example, um Bermuda grass, if you cut it at 28 days, you know, from the last cutting. You know, that's going to help you more, you know, from a forage quality standpoint. Um, then I guess, you know, the big question is that summertime is like, all right, you know, do I delay my cutting because of rain or do I cut it because it's ready to cut? And oftentimes you take a bigger lick from a forage quality standpoint if you wait longer to cut it to dodge the, the quarter inch or half inch of rain. So, you know, from a quality standpoint, you still have that internal moisture there. So I don't think it's going to be a big deal. I don't think you're going to lose that much quality, you know, from, from an internal moisture standpoint. Um, because rain, if you have a lot of internal moisture, then rain's not going to impact forage quality that much. Okay. All right. I've I bailed the, uh, the millet before, but I've never mm -hmm. did sorghum, and I wanted to try that. And the other thing is, uh, what um, if I went out and uh, because I don't have a crimper, uh, if I went out and uh, just with the tether and and tethered it, uh, if I had to tether it, say if I had to tether it twice, uh, is once it dries like that, will that seed um, maintain integrity or will it break that seed head break up? It would probably break up. Okay. Because you're you're going to be cutting this, you know, uh, boot stage to early heading, probably, you know, so w with a lot of these annual grasses, you know, boot stage to early heading is the time to get it from from a, you know, good forage quality standpoint. Um, so, you know, you're probably at that early stages of seed development, mm -hmm. you know, at that stage of, of, of at that stage where that forage is. That's for baleage. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, boot stage, yes. Mr. Jeremy, real quick, uh, are there any, um, when it comes to um, clover, are there any herbicide-resistant clovers? That's the challenge with clovers, they're so expensive, but whenever you start spraying it with herbicide to kill your weeds, I mean, that normally... Yes, uh, so in perennial forage systems, are you talking about white clover or, or an annual clover like crimson? Yeah, like crim yeah, crimson, yes. Yeah. So oftentimes I tell producers if you want to incorporate clovers into a into a pasture system, you know, if you're doing crimson, then that just eliminates all your broadleaf herbicides. Um, your white perennial clover, um, your white clover, you know, is more tolerant to 2,4-D. Um, but you know that that entering in that that crimson clover for nitrogen generation that that's gonna that's gonna make broadleaf weed control a lot challenging for sure right okay so the majority of us you know the, the, when it comes to forage you know we're trying to get away from a feed based um system to a forage based system because a lot of us raising steers and basically we're trying to get to that ideal 600 pounds at um weaning weight if possible you know anywhere between 550 and 600 so do you feel with Millet is the best way to get there. I mean, as far as trying to put that weight on our calves, and I know it's tough during the summer months. It's hot, 
a lot of things are working against us, but that's the biggest challenge that we have is trying to put weight on the calves. That's right. And so, and like I say, feeding them is really not really an option. I mean, I'm not saying it's not an option, but it's just too much to put weight on it by buying feed. And we think a forage-based system would be our best option for us trying to um, put weight on them and basically stay within a budget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is everybody fall cabin or spring cabin? Uh, most of us are trying to do spring. Um, we know we do have some in the fall, but um, a lot of us are doing spring calving. Yeah. So, so pearl millet, I think, would be an excellent option. It, it you know, from a grazing standpoint, um, you know, hay. You know, I kind of like the winter annuals too. You know, if you can kind of fit that in there, even if you don't graze them, you can still make good quality baleage out of it. Um, and then that's what a lot of growers around here do. We go with the winter annuals. We do, you know, spring cabin, and, and then we try to do pearl millet, you know, when it's not, you know, extremely hot, you know, even though we do have lower weight, you know, weight gains with that, um, you know, so the pearl millet from, I, I like pearl millet from a summer annual standpoint. Um, it gives you a lot of flexibility there. It's just trying to fill in that forage gap that I think we're some of them oat the oat baleage and winter annuals kind of fits in that 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 gap, you know, in that late summer, early fall time frame. So I think that's kind of how how you fit that in. So you're talking about your rye grain, mixing your rye grain, your rye grass, and then possibly some clover in there. And then um you plant your we should be able to plant our millet like now. Yeah, I know tax day, yeah, I think tax day is a good, at least in this area, is a good compromise. Now, this winter, I don't know when, I don't know when, you know, we had like Christmas and Christmas Eve, you know, we got, you know, 18 degrees, but, you know, we had extremely warm temperatures in February. I had many questions about in the, in the February, 1st of March, you know, about planting pearl millet, it was warm enough. So tax day would be a good compromise from a soil temperature standpoint, you know, to put in your summer annuals. So do you recommend planting two crops of millet, maybe like one to 15th of April, and then maybe another 15th of, because uh, to my understanding, the pearl millet is what about a, what is it, a 90 day when it's most polluted? Yeah, yeah, it, it all depends on how you manage. You know, it, it's 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 kind of hard to manage um, stubble height and stuff, you know, with, with pearl millet and stuff, but it can be done. Um, you know, you can try to stagger it, but, you know, the yields are going to be obviously a lot lower, you know, once you get in the June and July because of the heat and dry weather and, and what have you. So it just depends on how many head you're feeding, you know, we can do some math on, you know, how much, how much dry matter you need yeah. because, you know, with fertilizer prices and stuff, it, it costs a lot of money to, to establish these, these annuals. That that research that you showed kind of indicated that it wouldn't really be cost effective, especially I mean because of the seed that that study that you, you that Dennis Hancock did. Yeah, so that was that was really good um, because I still see people try to stagger it, but you know it it's just you know there's such a yield drag on these planting dates. Yeah. So if you get into mid July, is that half a half a yield really worth that much money? Because you're still going to have to put down, you know, you could probably curve your inputs a little bit, like your nitrogen inputs, but you know, is it really going to be worth, you know, a half a yield to do that? Unless it's just an extreme situation where we need something. Yeah, I, I guess the the challenge that we have also is trying to connect these phases. Your whenever your forage is at its most prolific point of growth or producing the highest, you know, the uh, T and D and the um, crude protein. And also when your cows are lactate, lactating also. Mm -hmm. So having those in sync, you know, so that's the thing that you have to, what I'm understanding that you have to have all that in sync to help that, that calf along the side to make sure that whenever your forage is at its best, that, you know, you at a stage in your lactating of your cow, that they're going to be able to take advantage of that high nutrient value also. So just trying to get all that in sync is, is a challenge, but I can see where 
if you could get all that in sync where it can help you um, become more efficient and reduce a lot of costs in feeding feeding your calves rather than on feed rather than just say, okay, I'm strictly um, basically on a forage base um, um, management system. So, so it, you know, it seemed like a few years ago at a lot of forage conferences and beef conferences, you know, they were they were really harking on a 300 day, you know, grazing, you know, system, which is kind of hard to do. But you know, with these annuals, you know, if you can figure out how to do baleage, I think we can kind of level out, you know, the playing field a little bit. We could take some of that that growth here. You know, if you can dry it down the, you know, the correct moisture, we can store it. And then, you know, we can we can kind of distribute that, that forage yield when we need it. Because in the summertime, it gets, ooh, it gets hot. You know, it, it becomes a challenge, you know, to try to, you know, hay becomes a premium. So, you know, that I think that's where some of this baleage can, if we do some planning and, and, and be able to do baleage, I think that would be, you know, something that we can try to utilize, you know, some of these surplus forages for. I, I had just a comment. I know, um, Jeremy, and, and some of these may be too expensive for most situations, but I know I've had some, I had one, uh, uh, I've seen a cow producer that mixed up sun hemp sunflowers all, all different kinds some cow peas mm -hmm. um with some with some uh summer annual grasses and and had like you know real thick different kinds of forages and and i i i planted some cow peas we planted it for some goats but um i ended up with the cows eating it because everything outgrew the goats the goats couldn't keep up oh, with it but I didn't have any luck with the sun hint we tried for, for goats, but I've seen people graze cows, goats, and sheep with cow peas, sun hemp, and sunflower. Have you ever seen any of those used? Actually, you know, I'm from um I'm from lower Alabama, LA. And last time a couple of years ago, I seen some folks around our neighborhood planting, you know, that same exact mix. I think there was sun hemp, there was cow pea. Um the sun hemp is interesting up until it gets, you know, it's a good quality forage up until it gets mature. It becomes yes. very rigid, you know, it makes a lot of biomass. Mm -hmm. um, the cow pea is, is really quick. So that, you know, so I think that would be, you know, a really good emergency forage if you had some seed. Um, and I think that could fit, fill, it, fill in a gap where you just had no choice. Um, yeah, and so, I mean, I think those are fairly high protein. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. a, as well, they they are more expensive, I think, than the pearl millet. I guess it depends on what seed is available. And sometimes with these mixes, we can get too complicated. I agree. You know, with uh, with cover crops or you know forage systems, you know, it seems like we need to start off with one one species and kind of learn um and then kind of branch out because sometimes if we get too complicated there's a lot of inner competition and then you know we're just adding a lot of cost there jeremy yes a few minutes ago you mentioned that uh pearl millet may be a good option if you having in the spring how about the winter so if you're in the winter so you know so if you're oh, captain fall winter, calving fall calving well then we have the luxury there of uh winter annuals you know your rye ryegrass you know that that's you know the ryegrass is is good stuff oftentimes you know with winter annuals like for example this this fall you know we went through that dry spell there was quite a few folks that could not establish it in their pastures or whatever so they're they're kind of struggling now with peanut hay you know this and that but if we can get that you know rye ryegrass um, mixture going, you know, probably 60 pounds of rye, 20 pounds of rye grass. You know, I think that would be, you would get that early grazing from the rye and then a lot of good grazing now from the rye grass because right now that rye grass is really kicking in. Um, so, you know, for, for fall cabin, I think that would be 
a great option. Would you put any clover in there? Um, yeah, if you had your weeds under control, I think that would be, you know, a good option to try to offset some of these nitrogen costs. Um, you know, it's not going to be uh, an immediate um, benefit, but, you know, as long as you have that, that clover there, crimson clover, you know, after a while, it's going to build up some residual in there, which would offset the, the cost of the fertilizer, man. And I, so again, I had a, a friend that had sheep, but also I've heard of people doing it for cattle. Turnips, chicory, um, I think Susan Duckett in Clemson fed out some calves on chicory. And um, I, I want to say two pounds, over two pounds, average daily gain. Um, on on chicory have you ever had any have you had any experience with with any Not of those? With chicory i know a couple of years ago we were playing with tillage radish or some of these daikon radishes um both as a cover crop and also forage systems um i think with the with these brassica crops we got to plant plant them earlier i think we got to be in september um you know, to get the biomass. We had a demonstration a couple of years, I think it was two years ago, um, where we planted um, on a grower farm. We we had the forage brassica out there. I think it was T-Raptor. And we planted it. Well, I think we planted it in October and November, and it gave us some really good forage quality there. We took some samples, had great forage quality. Um, you just got to get the cows to learn how to eat it. You know, you got to get them used to it. You know, it, it it it's it's a quick. I think it's a quick crop that can that can you know give you some quality there if you plant it early enough. Um, let me ask you something uh, on the on my porridge pasture. Um, tell me about invasive grasses. Um, one of the invasive grass I got is smut grass. I just... Oh, oh boy. So smut grass is interesting. So right now. I've getting more questions on smut grass and basy grass. So smut grass, it's hard to get a perennial grass out of a perennial grass. So Velpar is 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 an option, but if you have oak trees within a hundred feet, you know that per, that that is a challenge. But Lisa and 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 Lisa Baxter and also um Jennifer, you know, over there at Lapahal, they're doing some really interesting research looking at systems approaches to getting rid of some of these um like smut grass so you know they're using a pre such as like resolon um fertilizing it and then coming back with a velpar a little bit later so it's not a you know everybody wants this one shot you know with perennial grasses that's hard to do but basically you know eliminated competition fertilizing it and then coming back with a velpar you know, maybe a good strategy. Um, I've seen some work out of Florida um, looking at Velpar applications, and Velpar is kind of quirky in that you got to have just the amount of rain, just just enough rainfall, like an inch or so, to wash down the root zone because it's all soil. You know, it, it's it's Velpar is all soil uptake, so. You can't have too little. You can't have too much. You got to have just right. You have to have timing, and you know. So Velpar is very challenging to use. Now, Vasey grass is a different thing. Um, Vasey grass likes lower, wetter soils. So you know, Pastora has okay activity on it. Um, you know, wick bar may be an option if you can get that differential between canopies for both species there. Um, but you know, if I, if I had the cure one shot deal for, for, for both of those species there, I'd be, a <laughs> I probably wouldn't be a county agent. Well, well, I mean, you say they're in Lapa Hall, so that's about 20 miles from me. So mm -hmm. maybe I can reach out to them. So, so it's more the, I guess the more of the story is a systems approach. So if you, if you look at fertility, 
you know, eliminating them early season competition weeds and then coming back with a fall application, you usually fall applications of herbicides are more effective on perennial weeds compared to the spring applications because the way the energy is going, you know, so in the fall, a lot of energy is going into storage, so it takes down more herbicide. So I think you said something about wiping if you get the differential in the in the forage height wiping it with a with a wiper like you know with a rope wheel. yeah so there there's um i think there's a study done at i think it's in the national county agent journal or whatever but anyway they got these atv wick um rope not really rope wigs but it's kind of like a wiper with a carpet that kind of rolls I, thought they, I think they actually called it the weed wiper. Anyway, you can pull it with an ATV. Um, we're probably going 50% of the, I think, solution of glyphosate, but it's it's slow. You got to get both sides. Um, and some of these smut grass fields down here are just getting to the point where we got to make up our minds. All right, are we going to, you know, tear it up and start over? Um you know, it, it's hard to do that. It's hard to make that choice, but. So you were saying that Velpar is soil movement, soil uptake, so you can't wipe Velpar? I think they've tried that. So it, it's more root uptake with the Velpar. And, and the problem, I think um, Dr. Sellers out of Florida actually did some work looking at, looking at rainfall after Velpar applications. So you just need, you need about an inch, you know, for for that root uptake, because you'll have less efficacy if you have too little, or if you have a gully washer after application, it's going to wash it past that root zone, so you lose efficacy there. So it's kind of people get frustrated with Velpar because it's expensive and it works sometimes, sometimes it don't. I've seen people use um, lower rates but do it in sequential years. And that may be another strategy to kind of offset that cost there, because if you keep on hammering it, um, hopefully you, you'll get some efficacy. But sometimes these 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 hay fields, if you have just so much smut grass, sometimes it's better just to start over if you if you can. Um, yeah, the, the problem is, yeah, yeah, the seed bank, seed bank, but but the. Um, you know, because if you have the seed bank, it, even starting over, you don't replant it when you, it, it seems like it. But I, I had a, a guy that I'm fighting it too, but in South Georgia at my personal farm and here at the university. Um, but I had a, a, a guy say he, he just kept it mowed, just mowed, mowed, mowed. And, and, and like you said, tried to get the, the fertility and everything right so that his Bermuda grass came in strong and smothered out the the smut grass and then in some places he had to replant but yeah. he said he just hit it hard kept it mowed um and and you know tried to to let his Bermuda outgrow it smother it out and then in places where he couldn't he he had to replant but, I think the old I think the old rule of thumb with smut grass is if you take ten steps in a in a pasture and if you can touch smut eight out of ten steps, it's probably beneficial at looking at different options there. Um, yeah, I I had one little paddock that I wiped with some Velpar and one of the ATV rope wipes wipers and because uh, it was a small three acre pasture, mm -hmm. uh, little paddock area. We were just trying it and it, it seemed to help, but it grew back from seed. You know what I mean? So <laughs> Yeah, that's um, right. It's just. And the the ones that were too short to hit the rope, you know, it, um, that grew back. But anyway, we're still fighting it. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, so uh, that, definitely a systems approach is what we need to probably do. So. Yeah, in my area it's really wet where 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 the where I got this problem at. Mm -hmm. We appreciate everybody for coming, and we appreciate you, Jeremy, for being here and helping us out. Glad to do it. Hope everybody has a has a nice rest of their your evening. <laughs> <laughs>